Hello America and welcome to my home in the Mountain West, the Standing Rock Ranch. We're nestled here in the middle of the Caribou National Forest and just this morning the deer and the antelope were <laughs> running and playing over there and yesterday a bald eagle was over the lake. There's something very American here. It was named after a piece of a mountain that toppled off the canyon face over there only to land standing up. It was actually sacred land to the Shoshone tribe. Later it was a sacred place where pioneers stopped and spent the Sabbath just to admire God's beauty and rest before they continued their journey west. And it is now a sacred place for my family and me. And I am glad that you are here. I was going to host Restoring the Covenant in Gettysburg this year. It was going to be epic, and I mean truly epic. But then COVID happened, and it changed our plans, and quite honestly, it changed our world. The song you just heard was written for a joint project that the Stewart brothers, Brett and Brandon, and I worked on a few years ago, named To Be American. I told them the stories of the founding, the Civil War, the actual meaning behind the National Anthem and the Statue of Liberty, and they wrote over two hours of music that stirs the American soul, all performed by their millennial choirs and orchestras. It's an all-volunteer, non-denominational group with thousands of members in five states from California to Texas. <sighs> that song, as I was listening to it, I thought to myself, do we even know what it means to be an American anymore? Because I thought I did, but I'm not so sure everybody agrees now. It seems so easy and simple in a song. Our founding fathers founded this nation under God that we may worship him and spread his name abroad. We shall prosper in this land if we tread his ways and follow his command. Dare I even ask how America feels about that today? You know, when you set that to music, it's easy, it's happy, it's celebratory, it's confident. The 4th of July is the same thing, except this year. I don't feel any of those things. Independence Day has always been about hot dogs and family and fireworks. But the fireworks that are happening in our streets of our country right now put me in a place where it just doesn't feel right to wrap ourselves in the flag and cheer for the military flyover. And perhaps that's been our problem. Did you know that we didn't actually have a standardized flag until Woodrow Wilson about 1918? I mean, you could arrange the stars any way you wanted and it was fine. We didn't have a national anthem until the 1930s with FDR. Until then, we kept going back and forth and people could pick whatever song and a lot of times they played a song called Hail Columbia, which was awful, but that's another story. The reason why I bring that up is because we're not a standardized nation. That's not who we're supposed to be. We are a collection of misfit toys. We really are. We're all different people coming from, from different places with different ideas and we all agreed on one thing. We weren't supposed to agree on everything. Just the important stuff. E pluribus unum from many one. And that one thing that we had in common was the idea of liberty and freedom and justice for all. Gotta be honest with you, we all know our ancestors, we have even screwed that up many times through the course of our nation. But of course they did, and of course we have, because we're men, we're only human. How many important things have you done in your life that you screwed up? That's why, while some of our founders weren't the biggest fans of religion itself, they all believed in the tenets of Christianity, which was all based around forgiveness and grace. And we have lost that, and we need those things now more than ever. Because we have been a nation that has been great and terrible, sometimes <laughs> at the exact same time. But we look forward. Are we getting better? Up until a few years ago, I would have said yes, but now, honestly, I, I don't know. And I don't even know now if we can hold this nation together. Lincoln said once, if America should fail, it will, it will fail and it will be toppled by a destroyer named us. And I think he's right. 
tonight, I think, is going to be historic, some way or another. We are going to talk about a plan, something called the American Covenant. It's just three easy steps. And it's, it's not my idea, it's really, it's, it's not even Abraham Lincoln's idea. He was just the last one to do it. When, when I had Gettysburg planned for 4th of July, we had fireworks like you wouldn't believe. I had an original score to tell the story of America in a way that you've never heard. And then when COVID happened, the best laid plans went to heck. And then a month ago, my family and I left our home in Dallas and we came here. And I felt the strength and the, the sacredness of this land. And I realized that that's what the covenant is supposed to feel like, personal. The invitation is quiet and gentle. It's not garish and a spectacle. We, we have lost touch with this. When I lived in New York, I, don't, I, I couldn't remember the last time I saw the stars and I felt small. We had a partnership with each other, with God, with the land. And, and America has never been about that breast-beating lie of manifest destiny. That's a distortion and a lie and dangerous. The American promise was about living the golden rule, the Ten Commandments, loving and serving our fellow men, caring. It's strange to say, because of all the damage COVID has done, but I think it's actually maybe a blessing in disguise, a chance for us to be quiet and reconnect with our families, to know what's truly important, to then assess where we are and make a plan for where each of us as individuals are going and where we want to go as a people. But to do that, we need further light and knowledge and we need to do it without anger and malice in our hearts. And I know how hard that is. I look at the news and I know you do the same thing. It's my job to look at all of it and digest it and then pick through it to see what I can help you understand or to give you some sort of perspective. And some days, and in fact, most days now, I am left speechless but by what I'm reading in the news. I'm guessing you're the same. You're watching America This Morning. A sharply divided. On the articles of now then, what makes a nation strong? Well, Americans are deeply divided the over the political uh, division. That was the American public deeply divided. The political divide in... History says we'll roll forward on momentum for a little while, but we'd better get some more gas in the tank pretty quick. Of gang rape. So they could then be gang rape. Really raped. doesn't sound good. Horrible. Republicans now are mad. This is the most unethical sham. The opioid crisis may be far worse than There's this. a little baby in here right Nine now. One 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 in withdrawal. Yeah, I think he overdosed. The rate of suicide nationally has been on the rise since 1999. What's next for the people of Hong Kong? Hong Kong flashing. Pro-democracy movement. You guys value freedom? American embassy in Baghdad under siege. Oh, oh, serious respiratory virus. Form of viral pneumonia. Officially hitting the U.S. Three people have died. Flattening of the so bat suits. China is still lying. No. Essential workers stay home. See, ours is not the first by George good government to arise on the world stage. There have been several. Feeding my kids is not selfish. And then each decayed away. Uh, people filing for unemployment benefits. Not one of them was ever destroyed by anybody else's marching legions. I'm not going to shut the salon. Each rotted away, morally, socially, culturally, economically, simultaneously. A Minneapolis police officer the video that has caused outrage across the country. Who says black lives matter? Hitting of public monuments, symbols of white domination. Look what you did to my store. Look what you did to my store. Come on, G. Come on, G. Damn, man, I was a TV's cop. I was a TV's man. For real. 
This is my granddaddy car. We could end the summer of love. Man. History promises only this for certain. We will get exactly what we deserve. What we deserve. Looking at the state of our world, now our country, I can't help but think of the story about Ben Franklin. It was the last day of the Constitutional Convention. He was in so much pain. They actually had to carry him because he couldn't stand the pain of walking on the cobblestones. And he sat quiet all through the convention, really didn't say very much. And at the end, everyone turned to him, the wise old man, and said, Mr. Franklin, what do you think? He said, I have been sitting here listening this whole time and I've been pondering the carving on the speaker's chair. It was a carving of a sun with the rays. He said, I've been wondering the whole time, is that a rising sun or a setting sun? He said, but now that I see what we've done, I know, gentlemen, it is a rising sun. There is a powerful, powerful darkness that has stretched its arm all across this land. But is that darkness an ending? Is it a destructive force? Or will it be something that helps us reach deep down inside of ourselves and find out who we really are and what, what, what each of us have to do? Will it humble us? Will it turn us back to Him and the timeless truths that run through our story? Will we then stand for those truths and begin again? We face the biggest decision that any of us will ever face. In fact, I think we face a decision now that few humans have ever faced, have ever even had within their reach. And it's an honest question and perhaps one that we should have been asking every year on Independence Day and now only in hindsight. Do many of us see the errors of our ways? But each generation in their own way has had to ask themselves at times of great trial and risk this simple question. Is this worth dying for? Is, is this worth fighting for? Is this country, her ideals, achieved or still yet to be achieved worth living and striving for? Is this what we want? Is this what's best and most effective to lift not just us, but all of mankind to a better place? Is there a better way so man is free to live as who he is destined to be? Churchill was asked at one point what the best system of government was, and he said, well, this one, it's the worst, with the possible exception of every other system devised by man. It is, it's ugly. It, it doesn't work well. Does it still work at all? See, I think this is the question that we need to ask. This is the conversation, not the argument. Not the petty name-calling and public shaming that, quite frankly, would make Joseph McCarthy blush. We should be asking ourselves, is there a better way so we could all live together and not oppress one another, to live free of tyrants and remain safe and prosperous? And if it's not this, what is it? In just a few years, America will celebrate her 300th birthday. And this is the year that is the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Mayflower. And many Americans, including myself, is not sure we're going to make it to 300. But I know this, God's will, not mine, not anybody else's, God's will be done. But should it come, it should come by our choice, not through fear or intimidation or riots or by apathy and denial. 
This great nation should not slip into obscurity and a new one rise in its place with nothing more than a whimper. You know, we've, we've screwed things up because guys never read the directions, okay? We just don't. You get something and you're seven steps into it before you realize you're building it upside down because you don't read the directions. Well, that's the Constitution. We're not reading the how-to. See, the Constitution tells us how to build things, but it doesn't say what we're building. That's our mission statement. That's the Declaration of Independence, and it is one of the most noble and powerful ideas of any age of mankind, that we the people, that means you and me, that we see things, they're self-evident, we see them so clearly that, that they, they no longer even need to be taught. And that idea is that all men are created equal. All men. And they're endowed by their creator with certain unchangeable rights. And then among these are the right to life. No one has the right to simply take my life, white, black, blue. It doesn't matter. You can't do that. No one can come to my house and break my door down and just scoop me up and throw me in jail in the middle of the night. I have the right to liberty. I have the right to Face my accusers. And the last one I find so ironic. It was originally, we have a right to property. But our founders knew that some southern states would take that and say, that man is my property. And our founding document says I have a right to property. So they changed it to the pursuit of happiness. And what does that mean? An amazing thing. It means I can do and be who I was born to be. No one has a right to dictate to me who I am or what I can become or what I can do. No one. And I pay the price if I make a mistake and I reap the benefits. If I'm a success, I'm judged by the content of my character, my words, my actions. That was Martin Luther King's dream. As he said, America, live up to your own promise. That's the American promise. And it's a blessing that this country brought into existence and into fashion. Still today in the United Kingdom, in China, in India, and indeed still the greater part of the world, if you're not born into the right family or the right class, you can't achieve your dream. You can't have that job. You'll never obtain it because who your family is. That is what we left behind. That's why people got into boats and came here. Each man is his own. And when done right, he is only judged by his acts and his words. And when he errs, as everybody does, he recognizes his problem, he repays the debt, and he starts all over again. This is the land of forgiveness. In America, the home of the big boat cars, those huge cars. We understand there's a reason. Our rear view mirror is only this big. And, and the front windshield is so huge. Because we got to check where we've been. But we look forward. Where are we headed? The question I want you to ponder tonight is whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. But it is truly up to us. And I don't know about you, but I am so ready to find the answer together by asking honest questions, using honest and actual stats, scientific measurements, real history. 
We may find a better way. I don't think so. I think Churchill was right. We will most likely find rehashed systems that have failed and brought misery and hunger. But perhaps this system of government has seen its better days, and it is time for something new. Because the horizon is huge. There's something new on the horizon. But you have to know history as well. If you were born and raised and educated in the last 25 years, with what I was taught and now knowing what you have been taught, you, you don't know anything of this epic, epic story. And if I didn't know the story, I don't think I'd mourn the passing of this country either. Because it all seems the same, doesn't it? But before we decide, I and a few friends want to tell you a story today. And it is a story that I learned from my mom and my dad and my grandparents, my aunts and uncles. I set out to test its truths myself when I was your age. And it is a true story. And what a story it is. It has everything. It has fencing and fighting and torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, and miracles. No, that's the Princess Bride. But our story has a lot of that stuff in it. And our story begins in 1619, and it is very different than the New York Times version, which is now being taught in our schools all across the country. I exposed that earlier this week on a special. Many scholars, in fact, leading black scholars, say the so-called facts in the 1619 project, and certainly the conclusion of that project, is beyond unfair. It is a dangerous lie, and a lie designed to tear us apart. In fact, just a few days ago, the writer and the head of the 1619 Project said, quote, it would be an honor if America burning, rioters burning police stations and restaurants coast to coast were named after my work, end quote. I, I, I don't even understand that, and I feel sorry for people that feel that way, that they haven't been able to connect with the goodness of this land or the goodness of her people. They've only been able to see the scars. So tonight, I ask you not to believe a word I say. You just take the facts that we present here. You make notes. You go do your own homework. You look for original sources, the diaries, the letters, and the actions of those involved. You can listen to the scholars who admittedly hate this country and the people that they're telling you about. Or you could listen, not to me, but to the people themselves. Read their words. After all, 400 years from today, we are going to be judged in the same way. And would you rather have your life and your deeds told by those who despise you or your own words and actions and the words of those who actually knew you? That's fairness. So we got a lot to tell you. And our story begins in Plymouth, where the sun is just beginning to turn orange of the setting or a rising sun. Early today, Tim Ballard, the head of Operation Underground Railroad and the Nazarene Fund, was at an important rock. But it's not Plymouth Rock. It's actually a rock that's more important that most of us have never heard of. I'm standing here on an island in the Atlantic. Behind me is something called Pulpit Rock. On December 10th, 1620, a group of pilgrims gathered on this rock and did something special, sacred, profound, something that may be the answer to our national ills today. As they were sailing through the harbor, their mast broke in a winter storm and caused their boat to veer off out of control. All they could do is huddle up and pray that God would, would somehow deliver them as their boat was careening directly for the rocky, rocky shore of an island. Then the boat turned, ended up landing on a soft patch of sand, and they landed on an island. One of the crew jumped out of the shallop, Richard Clark, and this island was thus named Clark's Island. And they were ready to set sail again. But a group of the Lighting Congregation pilgrims said, we cannot travel on this day. 
December 10th, 1620 was the Sabbath, their first Sabbath in America. Now, if there was any time when the ox was in the mire, certainly this was it. They were reflecting upon their families, their wives who were sick and dying and starving, docked at Cape Cod, waiting for word, waiting for food, waiting for anything. And yet, they knew they needed God's blessing. They needed to show God that the covenant was real. And the Old Testament teaches us that the sign of that covenant that a people makes with their God is observing the Sabbath day. And so they stayed. They rested, they worshiped, and they worshiped at Pulpit Rock. Tim joins us now live from Plymouth. Tim. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, things are terrific here in Plymouth. The sun is just setting. It's that golden hour as I look over the water, and behind me you can see Plymouth Rock. Um, Plymouth Rock is more of the outward manifestation, kind of representing the civil government, the covenant within that. It's, it's public, it's out for all to see. And that's important. Um, but the more important part of this covenant is what's inside somebody, inside the individual. And that's what happened at Pulpit Rock. That covenant that was inside that made them stay and made them worship God on that first Sabbath. And it's not insignificant that that internal covenant is represented by a rock 30 times the size of Plymouth Rock because that's where it begins with the individual. I think it's interesting too that this rock got graffitied um, in, in this time of 2020 of, of mayhem and chaos. It was graffitied, and you know this, Glenn, you saw the, the pictures. We, we were talking, we were emailing to each other about this. Um, and, and that's what happens often with the civil part of the covenant that's, oh, that's, that's public facing. The adversary wants to hide history and change history. Why? Because in that history is the truth of the covenant which will save us all right now. And we need to take a note from the pilgrims who stayed true to the covenant, notwithstanding societal pressures, notwithstanding the hell they were living. Remember, in the winter of 1621, half of them were dead. Three-fourths of the women had died. And they should have, by all accounts, jumped back on that Mayflower, which was luckily still docked in harbor, and they could have gotten out of this hell and left. It was a failed experiment, by all accounts. And yet not one of them left this ground. Not one of them got on that boat. And as the Mayflower left and as it disappeared over the eastern horizon, the pilgrims fell to their knees and wept aloud, not knowing if or when they'd ever see civilization again. But they didn't buckle. That's the thing. They stayed true to their covenant. They stayed true to their history. They stayed true to who they were. And that's what we are struggling to do as a nation right now. There's a lot of societal pressure to say things and do things that we know aren't true, but we're scared of mob rule. We're scared of, 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 what's, of what people's agendas are going to say about us. We have to stay true, stay firm. Don't be thrown about by every wind of doctrine and idea, but stay true to the truth and to the covenant. It's our only hope for salvation, for national salvation. For amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on thee. Crown my good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Freedom beat 
across the wilderness. America, America, God man thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control. Thy liberty in law. Oh, beautiful for here is proof in liberating strife. And every game divine Oh, beautiful for patriotry That sees beyond the years Thine alabaster It's funny because if we were to deny um, that anything good came from those who arrived on the Mayflower, we would then have to deny Webster's Dictionary, uh, all of the beautiful, amazing art of Tiffany, the Kodak camera, the Kodak film, uh, portions of the New York Times, the Remington, because none of those things would have been invented if the pilgrims hadn't arrived because the pilgrims spawned those people. Daniel Webster, George Eastman, Lewis Comfort Tiffany. God only knows what Hollywood would be like because you'd have somebody else playing Bert and Mary Poppins because Dick Van Dyke is a direct descendant of the people on the Mayflower, as is Orson Welles, Christopher Reeve, Marilyn Monroe, Catherine Hepburn, Julia Child, Bing Crosby, John Lithgow, Richard Gere, Ashley Judd, Clint Eastwood. The art of Grandma Moses wouldn't exist. Neither would General Cushing. He's the guy that lost his life in the final stand against slavery at Gettysburg. We'd also be missing a lot of presidents. President Zachary Taylor, the Bushes, Garfield, who was martyred by a communist, Grant, who was also the general who won the war under Lincoln to free the slaves. He wouldn't be here. He wouldn't have lived. Coolidge, FDR, and both the Adams, John and John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy plays a very important role in the lives of slaves and the freedom of slaves. Now, these are not the only people that were directly descendant from the Mayflower Pilgrims. Many signers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were as well. And those are the two documents that Frederick Douglass in 1851 called the greatest anti-slavery documents ever created. 
He also went on and said, it's the duty of every American citizen to use the constitutional and political process at their disposal to bring the country in line with its founding intent. Isn't that what we should be concentrating on today? That all men are created equal? And he went on and he said, the proper interpretation of the Constitution should always be construed towards freedom and natural rights. This is what became the lens that focused the rest of his life in which he spent fighting for the equal rights of all people, not just African Americans, but women. Now, this wasn't always the case with Douglas. He had escaped slavery himself, and he originally thought, as many do now, that our founders didn't recognize blacks as men. And it's easy to say that Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. He's the guy that wrote, all men are created equal. How is it possible? Well, Frederick Douglass didn't stop there with just that question. He read the words and he studied the original intent of those who wrote those documents. And he became one of the Constitution's most vocal supporters. He became a great friend of President Abraham Lincoln and a strong advocate of the words of another man who now, today, we look on as, a, as another great villain, Thomas Jefferson. I want to stop there with him. I want to take you to another golden hour back east and another sunset. This time, we're going to stop in Philadelphia and in Independence Hall. This is where Tim Barton from Wall Builders in Mercury One is ready to tell you a little-known fact that puts that whole story of Thomas Jefferson up on its head. Let's go to Tim Barton in Independence Hall. Tim? Thanks, Glenn. I'm in Philadelphia, and behind me is Independence Hall. This is a place where, in 1776, the Founding Fathers met and drafted and adopted the deck. When the Founding Fathers are here in 1776, there's already incredibly high tensions in the colonies because you've already had the shot heard around the world at Lexington Green. You, you've already had the battle at Concord Bridge, the fighting along the road back to Boston, the Battle of Bunker Hill. And yet, with all of these problems, most American colonists are still looking for a way to find resolution. The problem was the king wouldn't even discuss a peaceful resolution, and he was beginning to revoke their rights as British colonists. So the states determined they should choose leaders, and the leaders should come and convene together and discuss the best path forward. Thomas Jefferson was part of the Virginia House of Burgesses, which is the legislative body of Virginia, who were choosing the delegates from Virginia to come here to Independence Hall. Jefferson wasn't even part of the group who was coming. Jefferson wasn't even part of the group who was coming, except one of the men who was chosen, it became apparent he was going to be out of town for business. And so Jefferson was chosen as a late fill-in substitute replacement for this guy. And so when Jefferson is getting here, he actually is put on a committee of five who is in charge of drafting the declaration so we can declare to the world why we are declaring our independence. Well, the committee of five that was put in charge of drafting the declaration was Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston of New York, and John Adams of Massachusetts. Livingston of New York and John Adams of Massachusetts. And although Jefferson was the younger man of the group, the other men pointed him and said, why don't you go ahead and, and you be in charge of writing this thing? So Jefferson took all the ideas. Jefferson wrote every grievance he thought would be pertinent and presented it to the bot. One of the most amazing things about Jefferson's early draft was he had a grievance. One of the longest grievances he listed was that the early colonies had tried to abolish or limit slavery in their colonies and the king had struck down every one of those laws. Jefferson further went on to explain that the king actually was perpetuating the slave trade by promoting the kidnapping of innocent people and selling them in bondage around the world. One of the very cool parts about this grievance is that Jefferson, in talking about the slaves, he said that these were men, and he capitalized the full word men. Why that's really cool is the only other words that Jefferson capitalized in his draft of the Declaration was the United States of America. By capitalizing men, the equality, the humanity of these Africans, and when this was presented to them, that grievance didn't make the Declaration, but the Declaration still had principles that would lead to eventual equality and laid the foundation upon which America was built. The Declaration states that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain and alienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. The Declaration clearly acknowledged that there was a God, that, that God had made all humanity equal, and that He had given them rights. And government's job was to protect those rights. 
This was something that became the foundation upon which every government in America was going to be built. And even though America didn't always live up to these truths, these truths were always the guiding light pointing the way forward for America. In fact, many founding fathers, many early abolitionists pointed to these words from Jefferson, reason that they thought slavery should be ended in America, that we should have full equality pointing back to the Declaration. Well, 11 years later, this very building, founding fathers once again reconvened. This time, the war for independence was over, and we recognized we needed a new system of government. Up to that point, we, we had had the Articles of Confederation, which was drafted during the War for Independence, but the inadequacies became very apparent. And even though some people wanted to try to fix the Articles of Confederation, people like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton said, we really need an entirely new system. So when the Founding Fathers reconvened in this place, George Washington was chosen to be the president of the convention. As the convention kicks off, there was high hopes that something positive might happen because you had leaders from all over the states coming together, but Every, every delegation from each state had their own ideas of the way government should operate. And surprise probably to everybody, no state liked any other state's ideas. So all they did was argue and bicker for the first four or five weeks. As, as tensions mounted and frustrations grew, Benjamin Franklin, who was the old man of the convention, he got up and gave a motion. And this happened on June 28, 1787. This motion was, it was the longest speech he gave during the entire convention. And as he was recognized by the body, he asked a question. He said, how was it hitherto that recognized by the body, he asked a question. He said, how was it hitherto that we have not once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Meaning, guys, why haven't we stopped and prayed and asked God for help? He continued that I have lived for a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I Franklin called on the other delegates to take time to remember God, to pray, to seek his help. And Benjamin Franklin is largely argued to be the least religious founding father. He's encouraging the other founding fathers to remember God or their plans might not be successful. Well, when Franklin makes his motion, this is just before the weekend leading into the 4th of July. So what they determine is successful. Well, when Franklin makes his motion, this is just before the weekend leading into the 4th of July. So what they determine is Let's take a long weekend that you can celebrate. The they went to the church of the Reverend William Rogers, who preached over them and prayed over them. And when they reconvened, the entire atmosphere had changed. All of a sudden, the founding fathers were able to work together and start devising new ideas for a government going forward. They built on the principles of the Declaration and... What they did is eliminated the power of the federal government. They, they decided they needed separate power, so they had three branches of government. They had a bicameral system of a House and a Senate, and, and the Electoral College helped choose a president to, to try to resolve the problems of representation and, and the population gap between the states. And over the next several weeks, they were able to successfully create the United States Constitution, which has been the most successful governing document in the history of the world. It's conceivable that the convention could have ended in nothing but frustration and disappointment had it not been for the moment when the founding fathers turned to God and called on him for help, recognizing that they needed God's assistance in what they were doing. And we know the founding fathers embraced this idea because their behavior going forward reflected this very notion of their need and dependence on God. The cows are coming home, so it's that time of day here at the ranch. Um, so what did we just learn from Tim Barton? We now know that Jefferson was not conflicted. He meant all men. And he talked about men putting on the auction block as being an affront to God. He knew exactly what he was saying. So now, how do we explain Jefferson? See, it wasn't Jefferson. It was two states out of 11. 11 said, yes, abolish slavery. Two stood in the way. And why? Because of the phrase at the very top, a unanimous declaration. They knew at the time, if there's one thing that divides us, everything we say must be unanimous. And if there's one thing that would divide us, well, the king will come and weasel his way in and split us up, and then it's over. So quite honestly, they did what we do. When we are stuck and we can only go as far as we can go, well, then what? We look to the future. It's funny because this is exactly what progressives do. 
This is the very definition of that political strategy that's now being condemned because the founders used it. Why didn't you abolish all guns? Why are there still AR-15s? Because there's no choice. That's as far as they could take it at this time. They're hoping, like I'm hoping with abortion, that things change. What are you telling me? You're settling for 12 weeks? No, that's as good as I can get it right now. I believe it's life at 11, but I'll take 12. There are times that we have to decide as a nation. That's the best we can do. And then just keep pitching, moving the ball forward. It's our only option. It's either that or go to war or what Marxists do, just kill all the people that oppose your belief. But that's not America. That wasn't what the founders did. That would have just been removing one deadly tyrant to replace him with another. And they took an oath on the altar of God. No king but God. Well, after the Revolutionary War was won against the greatest army and navy ever assembled. I mean, remember, this is a bunch of farmers, okay? It's like uh, us, me, and my cows, and my family going against SEAL Team 6. It doesn't happen. They knew that those blessings were just a continuation of the covenant. And now that they were forming a new country officially, they needed to renew its oath. And so they did. In a place called Federal Hall, which is where David Barton is, now just across the street from the greed of Wall Street today, there sits a quiet set of stairs and a statue that is now under attack in the last few weeks. A statue that stands on the exact spot where George Washington took the first oath of office. We're at Federal Hall in New York City, and this is where America's constitutional government went into effect in 1789 with our first president, George Washington, and the first federal Congress. Now, that first body was really quite distinguished. Not only had George Washington been president of the convention that wrote the Constitution, but one-fourth of the members of Congress had been fellow delegates with him in writing that Constitution. Now, George Washington was sworn in right behind me, and the activities of Inauguration Day had been set by Congress with the help of 14 religious leaders, including a rabbi and 13 Christian ministers. Now, over to the side is a plaque of George Washington kneeling in prayer, and that plaque of him kneeling in prayer really does kind of set the tone for what happened that day, for there were seven different religious activities during the inauguration. America at that point in time had a covenantal view of God and America. We understood that a covenant was a lot like a contract. There's responsibilities on both sides. We wanted and we needed God's blessings, but we also understood that we had to live by His standards if we were going to receive those blessings. So what were the activities of the inauguration? Well, if you go to the original records of the day, the first religious activity occurred at 9 o'clock that morning when church bells across the city began ringing, calling the people to prayer, gather in church, lift up George Washington, lift up the Congress, lift up this new government to God, commit it in His hands. After that, George Washington arrived by carriage here behind us at Federal Hall, and he was sworn in. He took his oath of office. Now, the American practice of oath-taking is something that's been pretty well established for centuries. We've done the same thing for a long time. It's deeply embedded in our laws. And a lot of those practices go back to biblical precedents. For example, in the Bible, in Genesis 26, God says, I swore an oath. And several times in the scriptures, he says, I raised my hand when I swore an oath. And then in Isaiah 62, God says, I swore by my right hand. And then in Deuteronomy 10, the scripture says, we're to swear oaths in his name. That's pretty much what we do in American oaths. We raise our hand, our right hand, we swear an oath, and we do it in his name. We conclude with, so help me God. So George Washington swore the oath. He had a hand raised. He had his other hand on an open Bible. After his swearing in, they went inside to the inaugural address. Now that's the third activity because he started his inaugural address by opening with his own prayer. The fourth religious activity actually dealt with the content of his inaugural address. In it, he urged Congress and he reminded them of what we knew. He said, the propitious or the favorable smiles of heaven 
can never be expected on any nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. In other words, if you don't live by God's standards, you're not going to get God's blessings. Now, that's the same thing we learned from the pilgrims and the Puritans. Back then, Governor John Winthrop had reminded the people, he said, if we deal falsely with our God, we'll become a reproach and a byword down to future generations. We'll be a laughingstock. That's what Washington was reminding them at that point in time. Now, the fifth religious activity was that Washington then called the Congress and the people to pray. And the sixth religious activity was he closed his inaugural address with his own prayer. Now, after that, the second religious activity was that President Washington and Congress walked outside of Federal Hall and they went right up the street to go to church together. When they got there, the Reverend Samuel Provost, who was the pastor of Trinity Church, he conducted the service. He led Congress and President Washington in prayers out of Psalms 144 through Psalms 150. He then gave Bible lessons and Bible readings out of the book of Acts and out of 1 Kings and out of the second and third epistle of John. And that little chapel, St. Paul's Chapel, interesting story about it, it sits right at the base of where the World Trade Center stood. And when the World Trade Center collapsed on 9-11, it destroyed everything around it except St. Paul's Chapel. Not even a window was broken when the trade towers fell. Maybe that's an indication of God's providential protection over the location where America renewed the covenant in 1789. Well, after that church service, George Washington and Congress came back to Federal Hall and they adjourned for the day. Over following weeks, Congress began working on creating a Bill of Rights. Now back in the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration set forth fundamental principles of American government that were enshrined in the Constitution. One of those principles says there is a divine creator. Another principle says the divine creator has given us certain guaranteed rights that we call inalienable rights. And a third principle says it's a primary responsibility of government to protect the inalienable rights of the people. So that's what they did with the Bill of Rights. They created a list of inalienable rights that were not to be touched by government. On the day that Congress finished the Bill of Rights, George Washington, with the encouragement and support of Congress, called the nation to prayer. That was the first federal prayer proclamation. In that proclamation, George Washington reminded Americans then and now of a simple principle. He said, it is the duty of nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. That's America's call to action today. Acknowledge God, obey His will, be grateful for His blessings, and humbly seek His aid and His protection. So this is where American constitutional government, the federal government, first went into effect and it did so with a very covenantal view that we had to live by God's standards. We love to sing the song, God Bless America, but it sure helps if we can give God something to work with. Back to you, Glenn. God Bless America. David is exactly right. He did bless America. This is the land that we love. There's something, come here, come here. Give, house, 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 house. House. All right. There's. God loves all lands, but there's something special about this one. And our founders knew that. The pilgrims knew that. They thought they were completing the trip uh, that the Israelites made when they first crossed the Red Sea. But to have this land, as rich as it is, with everything that is in abundance in this land, only a good and righteous people could possess it. And, and uh, for that to happen, well, let me say it this way. Let me show you what's right behind you. So what I wanted to show you here are the two flags that fly at the ranch. First one is the flag, the Bennington flag, it says liberty and union underneath. The founders knew we had to come together on a few ideas and we would have liberty. 
And beneath it is the George Washington positioning flag. This is the flag that flew wherever he was. Uh, it was his personal flag, the 13 uh, stars of uh, David um, on the flag. He, he knew that this land was sacred. He knew that it just wouldn't be any old group of people that would be able to do the miraculous things that needed to be done on the land. You had to be people of merit. You had to be people of virtue. And one day, right towards the very end, when the British were ready to uh, surrender, the soldiers knew they had won. They had just won a war against the biggest navy and army and the best trained people in the history of the world up until that point. And here are these farmers. And these farmers had nothing. Remember, in, in Valley Forge, they didn't have shoes. They didn't have warm coats. They had nothing. And as always, Congress really had betrayed them all the way through. They had never financed them, never helped them. Most of them were unpaid. Uh, and now they had just bested that army. There was, a, there was a secret talk behind the back of George Washington of when we're done with the British, let's just go to Philadelphia and let's just kill Congress because they're worthless too. They had this talk um, amongst themselves on the day that George Washington had ridden into Philadelphia to talk to Congress to plead their position. He came back and as that flag once again was hoisted, a little earlier than uh, they thought, he arrives back in and they are all in a room and they are plotting. And when he saw that the men were gone and all gathered together, he knew what they were plotting. He came in and he didn't know what to say to them because in many ways they were right. They were right. They had been betrayed and abandoned over and over again. Washington walked into the room and he said, I, I, I know what you're thinking. And I know what you want to do, but you can't. We, 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 we just fought against a tyrant and we can't become tyrants ourselves. He didn't know what to say, really. He was there for about 15 minutes with very few words spoken. He stood there and everyone was silent and he he reached into his pocket and he had a letter from a congressman that was sympathetic to the cause. And he pulled it out and he was going to read it to the men. But then he realized he couldn't because he didn't have his, gla have his glasses on. This is the indispensable man. This was the man that couldn't be killed. He was a giant. And they thought he, he, he had never been seen in glasses or shown any kind of weakness. And he finally had to put his glasses on and he looked up at the men and he said, gentlemen, you have to pardon me for I have grown not only gray, but blind in the service of my country. It was then that the men knew with tears in his eyes and tears in their eyes that he had humbled himself in a way he had never done before with them and the patient virtue that he spoke about so often rang again in their souls and they did not go and have another coup and he talked about their glorious example that they had exhibited to all mankind because of their restraint. George Washington and this land being free, they are tied one-on-one -on -one to virtue.
this is where I broadcast uh, every day. It's our broadcast barn here at the ranch. And I just wanted to take a couple of seconds and just stop in here to show you something and, and also talk about that song, Amazing Grace. We all associate it, I think, with you know Southern Gospel choirs, the Civil War, and all of that. But it's not about the Civil War. It's not even an American song, but it is about the slave trade. The wretch like me, that wretch was the author of that song. It was a man who was a notorious slave trader himself. And he was in a storm of his life at sea. And he was so desperate, he made a covenant with God. I'll change my ways, I'll change my ways, and I'll, I'll stop the slave trade. I, I won't be involved in it anymore. Well, that was a personal covenant. And when the skies opened up and he returned home safely, he kept his word. And he later wrote that hymn. It was called Faith's Review and Expectation. And it became one of the most popular songs in the world. It's the most recognizable song and the most recorded song of all time. And it has been sung by everybody. I mean, it was so, sung by both sides in the Civil War. It was used as a requiem by the Cherokee tribe on the Trail of Tears, which is so strange because they had slaves and they were bringing them along on the Trail of Tears. Civil rights protesters uh, sang it defiantly during the Freedom Marches. And on that hot and humid day in uh, August in Washington, D.C., that song filled the skies while Martin Luther King delivered his dream to America. The hymn rang out on the other side of the planet when Nelson Mandela was freed from prison, when the Berlin Wall came down. And on September 11th, it was sung to comfort a mourning world. And I think it's so powerful because it reminds us of our God, a God of mercy who still lights the way of the lost and the blind. And we are always lost and blind, quite honestly. And that's something that this new religion of the woke doesn't offer. It doesn't offer peace and comfort and forgiveness for the lost and blind. Let's look at the truth that many whites, including my great-great-grandfather, fought to stop slavery. He was on the side of the Union, and he lost his life in a notorious concentration camp in the South called Andersonville. My great-great-uncle also spent much of the war there, too, and he never fully recovered. One-third of those nooses hung by the Klan held the necks of white men who would not sit down in the face of evil. In very much the same kind of atmosphere that we have now in America, where if you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, you're banned. Back then, the Klan hung you. I think it's right when we hear righteous cries from good Muslims that are not part of terror. It's right to not condemn an entire race or religion. And if that is right, why do so many people condemn all police officers or all whites or all anybody for something the vast majority had nothing to do with? In fact, they fought their own people to stop it. Yes, free blacks fought in the Civil War on the side of the Union, but it was mainly whites fighting against whites to end slavery. More importantly, it was just a war where humans fought those who had lost all of their humanity. I'm not making excuses. I just want to point out that there, it's worse than any of us now think. Because by blaming whites or just America, we are so preoccupied with this that we fail to see that it was happening everywhere and still today. If you believe that it was a horror here, then you must also accept that it was the same horror in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, in Mexico, in Africa. You also have to accept that this is just as much of a horror for the Jews in Egypt that Moses freed. And may God have mercy on our souls, those of us who know that there are slaves today, enslaved by the Chinese making our phones, and yet we buy them. 
the evil of Islamists over in the Middle East that have taken slaves just because they're not Muslim. And those people who are still women and children enslaved here in the sex slave trade in the Western world, including the number one buyer, America. You see, Lincoln didn't fail. It's those who came after Lincoln. It's us. Perhaps us, those living now, are failing our God. I know we're failing the 40 million of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved today by ignoring the problem. And we're doing it for exactly the same reason the early Americans ignored the problem. It is too ugly to look at. It is too ugly to, to think about. Nobody wants to hear it, and no one can see a way to end it. So we avoid it. But that is wrong. Let's also fix the truth to this part of history because our heroes are not bigger than life. They were not perfect. And I think they would be horrified by the big marble statues of themselves. I know George Washington would be. They were not perfect. They were men, just like us. Let me give you an example outside of our own country, Churchill, villain or savior. Most people in the West, they'll say, oh my gosh, look what he did in the West. It was miraculous. He saved us. Uh, yeah, but you talk to people from India. Churchill was a monster in India. His work was miraculous and a horror show. So which is he? He's just like us. Both. It's that constant battle. See, life isn't about the sum. It's about the trajectory. Are you getting better or worse as time goes on? And that may be the case with Lincoln. While I don't think he was a bad man at all, uh, some could claim that perhaps he was a coward or a liar because of his first inaugural address. In it, he said, I qu I'm quoting, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so, end quote. What? So did he fight to free the slaves or, or not? This is important. If we are to take him for those few words alone, you would say he is not fighting for the slaves. But I would suggest you take a look at the before and after picture of old Abe first. Four years into office and he aged 80 years. He was a broken man by the time he died. He was beaten into submission. He really was. Now we know the South didn't believe him because they broke away from the Union as soon as he finished that address. And I suggest that they knew better. They knew he didn't believe what he's saying here. And here's why. John Quincy Adams now, this never happens today, but it did with John Quincy Adams because he was passionate about something. After he served as president, he ran for election to be in Congress. He was a congressman. And he tried to introduce anti-slavery legislation year after year after year. He wanted this evil to stop. In fact, they passed a law against him even standing up and proposing it anymore. I mean, he was relentless. And towards the end of his life, he knew, I'm not going to get it done. So he looked around. Who in Congress here is young, has some time, and gets it? Who can I get to pass this torch on to? Well, he found somebody. That young congressman was Abraham Lincoln. John Quincy Adams, whose forebears made a covenant with God on the Mayflower, took a man that he saw potential in that the world would later call Father Abraham under his wing and he passed all of the information, all the tricks of the trade and the mantle of the abolition of slavery to him. We know that Abe believed slavery was wrong. We have a document in Mercury One's archives that shows in the 1850s he's making a case in his own handwriting why it's so wrong. But I do believe he felt that the president didn't have the right to tell states what to do. So when the war broke out, 
Abe was at first just about keeping the Union together. But as we lost battle after battle and things got worse and Lincoln tried general after general, he was literally driven to his knees. He was, he was on his knees saying, what more do you want? What do you want me to do? It was then that Lincoln knew that this war had nothing to do with the Union and it had everything to do with all of God's children in captivity. Leading up to Gettysburg, the South had won almost every battle. Lincoln was getting his butt kicked. After Gettysburg, after the Covenant, which we will share with you here in a minute and ask you to take with your family, the North won every battle, I think except one. It cost Lincoln his life. Thousands of slaves found themselves free. But when they found themselves free, the question was, what does that even mean? What does it mean to be free? Well, one of the slaves that had to ask that question was the great-great-grandfather of Burgess Owens, a good friend of mine who agreed to go out to Gettysburg, and he joins us now. Burgess. I was blessed to have learned about my great-great-grandfather, Silas Burgess, about seven years ago. And it's interesting because my blessing, other than not only knowing about him, but finding out that I really didn't know him, I knew him through my father. It's interesting when you look through history and you find through that process, people whose lives, their personalities impact you in such a special way. He came here in the belly of a slave ship. He was sold to the Burgess Plantation, a very evil, evil man that actually because of his acts and his torture of his mother, either forced his mother to either escape on her own or take her own life. We'll never know what happened, but she, she said, sat Silas and her brother down and said, I just cannot stay here any longer. I have to leave. Silas, you need to take care of your, 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 your younger brother. Well, she left, never to be seen again. But thank goodness, Silas was surrounded by real men, men that were enslaved, men with their own shackle, but they never gave up on freedom. They were willing to take a risk. And they took that risk and didn't go north. Like I'd always taught, that was the way the Underground Railroad. They went southwest out to Texas. Because there was also Underground Railroads southwest. The same Americans, the same types that would help those who get their freedom heading to the north would be the same ones, the same types that would help my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather go west. These were Mexican and German Americans who up their homes, their fields, paid a little bit, gave a little bit of food so they can travel a little, little bit further, where my great-great-grandfather Silas ended up being a very successful entrepreneur, owned 102 acres of land, paid off in two years, started the first black church, the first black elementary school. But here's the message of that travel, that trip that he took from slave in the belly of the slave ship to Smithfield, Texas. You see, along the way, Silas saw a lot of evil. He saw being taken away from his, from his homeland in that tough trip in a slave ship coming to America to go to a plantation where nothing but evil and hopelessness was around him. But, but along the way for his freedom, he met other people. He realized there were Americans out there that weren't his same color and weren't the same as those who had captured him, but they were quite different. They were kind and they looked to Heavenly Father. They looked to a God that they had faith in to treat other people right. And along the way, he learned that he can do the same. He can actually forgive those who had treated him wrong, that he can be a, make a difference because everything that happened to him led him to this position in time where he saw himself blessed and saw himself as a leader and saw himself as the, the, the anchor to generations to come that would be first success in this country. It was the American people that gave my great-great-grandfather a second chance. And that second chance has led to me now Years later, through, my, through a dad who, who came back from war, who uh, could not go to, to, to get his postgraduate down in Texas because of the Jim Crow laws, but he kept trying because that's the idea of a free people. You never, never, never quit on your dream. The point I'm making, those who truly believe in this country, those who will take those tenets, 
you're one generation away from living the American dream if you don't give up. If you, if you understand that this is a place unlike any other, they can, you can dream big, you can fall flat on your face and start all over again as often as you want to. That's what true freedom comes down to. Burgess, it must be amazing to finally be in touch with your family's legacy. Um, so many of us grow up knowing the stories of our family, but many African Americans have had their history, both national and, and personal, stripped away from them. And it is important for us to be able to connect to the stories of our own past and our family's past, see how they weave into this history of a great nation. Burgess is there now with a friend of his, Kathy Barnett. Kathy also recently found something about her personal history that she has agreed to share with us. Kathy. I grew up on a pig farm in southern Alabama, but some of my family have been doing a deep dive and they recently discovered a photo of my great, great, great grandma Rhoda. Now, I heard stories of Grandma Rhoda as I was growing up, but I'd never seen a picture of her. I ha now have a picture of her. Grandma Rhoda was born in 1846. She was born a slave. <laughs> I'm so very grateful for her. You look at her face, it is a face of sheer determination. I inherited that, I believe, from my Grandma Rhoda in the face of insurmountable odds. I cannot imagine what our forefathers and mothers had to endure. And yet I always said to myself before I saw the picture of Grandma Rhoda that although I've never seen them, her blood courses through my veins, even as I stand here to you today. And I believe that I have an obligation to live well. <laughs> I believe black Americans who have the blood of slaves coursing through their veins, we have an obligation to live well in this nation. We are not victims. We are victors. We have overcome some insurmountable odds, being the equivalent of an animal, having our children sold on slave blocks, <laughs> separated and never to be seen again. And here we stand. I believe I have no idea what real racism looks like. I have no idea what real racism feels like. Yes, I've been called the N-word before. Yes, I believe people have acted in a way that if I sat and thought about it long enough, perhaps I can link it to, to them being racist. But I have no idea what it feels like to be bred as a business strategy. I have no idea what it feels like to be sold to the highest bidder. I have no idea what it feels like to use, to drink out of the dirty water fountain because I'm not allowed to drink out of the one that says for whites only. And although I, do, I, I have no idea what those things feel like, we all stand on the shoulders of those who endure the impossible so that you and I can now have the choice. America is not perfect. You will never hear me say America is perfect. I have taken the time to understand America, the good, the bad, the downright ugly in this nation and the opportunities. <laughs> there are so many opportunities. And today I can do anything. Will there be obstacles and challenges and will individuals who are racist try to oppose me? Yes, but in America, <laughs> unlike the Jim Crow law eras, unlike uh, slavery, that systemic racism, I don't have to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to test my literacy in order to vote. I get to walk in, I get to register and I get to vote we're still on the path of a more perfect union. And we will forever be on a path of a more perfect union because we are imperfect people. We are America. I am America's hands and feet and eyes. And if America is imperfect, it's because you and I are imperfect. But we continue 
to call out our wrongs and continue to move forward day by day by day. One of my greatest issues with the black community today is our inability to understand our worth <laughs> and our value as a people. Once again, we have white liberals primarily who have come into the black community to tell us what our problems are. We don't need white liberals coming into our neighborhoods and telling us what our issues are. We already know what that is. Our number one issue is that we do not have a seat at the table. My hope for the black community is that when we come out of all of this chaos and mayhem, that we will come out of this with more than having attended peaceful protest. That we will come out of this with more than just listening to pretty fine speeches, but that we will come out of this demanding full inclusion. That when primarily white liberals go behind closed doors and go into their boardrooms, Typically, black people are not in that room when they start discussing the black issue. My hope of coming out of all of this mayhem, all of the devastation that we've experienced, is that we will continue down the path of the second civil rights movement. And I believe that is continuing down the path towards full inclusion. Emancipation Proclamation gave us freedom. The civil rights movement put us on the path towards equality. Today, we're at the precipice of becoming fully included in the shared prosperity of this nation. That is my hope for the black community. Anything short of that would be shameful. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, it's an amazing story, I know deeply personal and it's got to be incredible to be able to share that with the nation there in Gettysburg, a place where so much suffering and sadness stands right next to freedom and hope. Now, we often associate Gettysburg um, with all of the country's history and connection to slavery, but many of us feel that slavery has nothing to do with us, that it's just part of our country's past and it really doesn't affect us not in the way that it impacts Burgess and Kathy. But I want to introduce you to someone else. Um, she's been in Gettysburg today, and I can't wait to hear from Anna Paulina Luna. Anna, what does it feel like to be there in Gettysburg today? When you come to a place like Gettysburg, as you can see behind me, you see a beautiful landscape. But when you think about the thousands upon thousands of fathers, brothers, grandfathers that came to this place to fight out the ultimate fight on, where were they going to allow the oppression of human life or where they can pick up the mantle, something that Jesus Christ talks about, true freedom, and fight for the new foundation of what this country was. You come here and you can feel that this area is indeed sacred. It was a place that Lincoln came to not only make a vow and a covenant to God, but it's a place that people came and paid the ultimate sacrifice. And as a veteran, someone who sees that still to this day, to understand that this place, our freedom was bought and paid for by none other than American blood. And it is our obligation as Americans to continue fighting for that very foundation, that very idea that gives us the ability, that gives us the privilege of being in one of the most blessed countries on the face of the planet. It is your obligation to continue that legacy. It is your obligation to fight for that freedom. And if we don't, we are only guilty as those that would seek to oppress and enslave mankind. When you talk about what's happening today in the United States, you talk about the level of freedom that we have, priding ourselves in, in being a country that has essentially eradicated slavery, but yet you have people that ignore the fact that there's human trafficking every single day in this country, that the United States, according to the 2019 Human Trafficking Report, is one of the top three countries in the world known for consumption of human beings. That is wrong. It is your obligation to take a stand against that. When you realize that that there are 18,000 women annually trafficked at the U.S.-Mexico border, or that UNICEF says that 16,000 children on average have become victims of human trafficking. Is that something that our founding fathers would have accepted? Absolutely not. Is it something that we all have a chance to fight? Absolutely. 
Within every single one of us, there's an abolitionist. We all have the opportunity to pick up our cross, to do what's right, and at the end of the day, answer for what we've done to fight for these people. And that's what I'm here today, to say that you have a chance to join this movement and to help end slavery. So what Anna has been talking to us about is something we're going to get to here in a minute. And I know when you hear action, you want to take action. We all do. And I'm going to get to that here in a minute. But we, we still have some other things we have to put into place. We have to put history solidly back in place. So the stories that surround Gettysburg remind us of our incredible heritage, the heritage of uniting for common good. Too many stories now of these kinds of heroes for us to be able to share here tonight. But I encourage you to go to the link you see now to get the entire story of Lincoln and how he came to commit to the covenant personally and for the nation. You will understand it much more deeply when you see that. And Tim Ballard was out at the place where it happened. Click on that. Now, the covenant itself, it was sealed with his life. Many gave up their lives and shed their blood and cried tears as part of the great covenant. It was, a, it was an earth-changing moment. It was a, not just the history of America, but it changed everything. And a moment that brought us together. And yet, many today believe that the blessings that should have come from this great sacrifice, the war between brothers and sisters, hasn't ended. And didn't give all men and women the freedom that they deserve. Today, many still believe that America is not the land where men are created equal and can live that promise. Is it true? Did we raise our weapons against our own fellow countrymen and our friends to not accomplish the goal of freedom? What is the honest history of African Americans in our nation from the Civil War on to today? And how can all of us together move forward from here when so many don't see eye to eye on what even happened in the first place or what is happening today and we certainly don't agree on a path forward at this time. Well, I want to introduce you to somebody. I want to sit down and have an honest discussion and find out how we can come together and heal and grow. His name is Bob Woodson. Uh, I asked him to fly out to the ranch today and, and come spend this day with us for at least a few minutes. He's somebody that I think every American should know. He is called the godfather of the neighborhood empowerment movement. He's been doing it for like four decades. He spent most of his life focused on the epidemic of youth violence, the stuff that everyone is ignoring, the, the violence that's happening in our own neighborhoods and then even worse in, in city centers like Chicago and L.A. and New York and Baltimore. We have to fix that. He was one of the early MacArthur Genius Awardees and the recipient of the 2008 Bradley Prize. He's had the Presidential Citizens Award given to him, 2008 Social Entrepreneurship Award from the Manhattan Institute. The guy is a machine, and he is now working feverishly on refuting the lies of the New York Times and their 1619 project with something you can learn more about and help spread at 1776unites.com. His name is Bob Woodson. Come on in. Sit. So, Bob, it is so great to have you here. Thank you for flying out and making yeah. this trek out into the middle of nowhere. Um, you and I both believe uh, that it is going to be the African American that saves the nation. The history of black America is, 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 is certainly mixed, but it never really totally defined all American. People are not no, just known or, uh, by the evil that has been visited upon them. How many of us want to be defined by the worst of what we were as a young person? Even slavery, as cruel, as brutal as it was, did not totally define the people who suffered it. So, and and, and, and they, they, did never, they were never totally defined by it. And what does not get told is the response of people to it. Frederick Douglass said when he was beaten by his master, he was 
a, a slave who was a man. But when he fought back and beat his slave master, he said, I became a man who was a slave, which meant, meant slavery was no longer in him. Correct. And that's what we're talking about. And, and I would say that there are people today, like the people with the 1690, who, who say to black Americans today that the conditions that you face, that all of these indignities that you're suffering was a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. See, that's the premise one has to challenge, regardless of, and, and, and so that's the lie that they tell to people to explain 50 or 60 years of failed policy in these cities. I, the movie, so then why, why does it not feel that way now? Blacks being trapped in that legacy of slavery coming into today, why is that not known, all the good because things? Because if they can focus attention on systemic racism, whatever that means, then no one will ask then why, what were the black officials who are running these institutions doing all this time? I'm a civil rights advocate, leader in the 60s. The promise to the black America was elect us to office and we will improve conditions that you've been suffering under these white leaders. And so no one then, as long as, and then they're now pointing to as if they were not there. So either they knew what was going on, either they were com complicit with it or ignorant of it. And so, but they don't have to answer those questions as long as they can point to systemic racism. Bob, I know you are, you're working on the 1776 project, which is, it's so amazing that we're having exactly the same argument we had in the 1850s. We were started in Plymouth. No, we weren't. We were started in Jamestown. Jamestown is the evil and the darkness and the greed, and that's the opposite of what happened with the Mayflower. And those two paths are very clear. One is destruction, one is not. Which one are we? I think like, the, like 1619, first of all, it's a false narrative. In, 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 in 1619, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones says that um, America is defined because of, uh, the, the founders were slave owners. Therefore, the documents that they, that they penned in 1776 are therefore flawful. That shows an ignorance of it, it, who it, these it really people are. And, yeah, But no. they also say America is incurably racist. Racism, it's in its DNA. And, and therefore, when you say something is in the DNA, you can't change it. Correct. And so what they're, the message that they're sending to the black community is that, that you have an exemption from any personal responsibility because you have no agency. And that is one of the most crippling and the most dangerous it's messages. Evil. It's evil. It's evil. To say, because nothing is more self-destructive than to provide a people with a good exemption from personal responsibility. And you have been in the communities, and, and just talk about a couple of stories. But there like are all kinds story of stories. About, um, There's one that I don't want to not mention, and that is Robert Smalls. He, he was born a slave, and his uh, master hired him out to a ship's captain, supply captain. And um, he uh, stole the ship and picked up the families of his crew, put on his, his master's hat, and successfully went past these five garrisons mm. and turned the ship over. And, the uh, and Lincoln uh, rewarded him uh, with a commission in the Navy mm. and also $1,500. Um, and Robert Small eventually, after the war was over, went back and purchased the, the plantation on which he was a slave. Wow. And he took in the family of the slave master. The wife was, had mental problems and the children were destitute. And wow. that's how, that's grace in action. Yes, it is. And so... And um, that's, that's what we need more of. This is an example 
of what's really in the DNA of Americans. It yes. is forgiveness. It is redemption. It is grace that defines America. It existed even during slavery. It exists today. The challenge and responsibility that we have is to go look for those examples of grace and action. And be those examples. Support them and be that example. Support them. Give them the kind of attention that they deserve. Hold them up as examples of America's values and action. Americans are in their DNA. They want to reward virtue. Um, and you and I have spent a few hours uh, before the broadcast talking about um, ways that we can make impacts together. And I am so excited, Bob, to have met you, to know you, to know your heart, and to see what you're doing. And I, I know we are going to be able to do some great things together in the future. I love you. It is an honor to meet you, and uh, we will talk again soon. Okay. Thank you, Bob. So, there is a path forward, but it has to be anchored in the truth and anchored in our history. And it's going to be tough, the road we have in front of us. The path forward is always tough. Learning from the bad, building on the good. It's not easy because nothing worthwhile is ever easy. But also, because like so many things, the first place we have to start is by looking inside of ourselves. Self-examination is one of the hardest things we have to do. We not only have to be honest about our country's history, but we also have to be honest about who we are and the role we each play in this. It's not just about healing our nation, it's about healing ourselves and starting with our families, healing our families. We can't make a covenant to save the country until we've made a covenant to save ourselves and our families. During this time of COVID, I told you it's been a time, it's been a blessing. It's been great self-reflection and chance for my family. We have dug deep and tried to figure out who we are, what we want, where we're headed and what role each of us play in each other's lives and our nation's lives. We've used this time to heal family rifts and really listen to one another. And it's an amazing what can happen to your family if you can all just come together and just listen to one another. Because everybody's wounded. A lot of times just through misunderstandings or things that the offending party didn't even know they did, really. They didn't realize. And that process is messy at times. And having those kinds of open discussions has not been easy for us as a nation. It's not easy when you sit across the kitchen table and try to tell the people you love how you really feel either. But if we expect to do it as a nation, we have to do it first with our families. It's hard to really listen and get past your own feelings and really listen to the other side to see how other people's feel and see the things from their point of view. Sometimes that's a member of your own family. Remember, when you're trying to put things together, this is not about politics. It's not about who voted for who and who's right. It's, it's about healing scars. And just like our national conversation, it can't be done unless everybody in the room really desires the same thing, a peaceful, loving family, a peaceful, loving nation. Some don't want that. Some just want their way. They want to be right. They want to win. People are very invested. You're very invested. And then there are those who just want to divide. Because our time is so short, we don't have time to get to everyone. So concentrate on those people in your own family and, and in life, your everyday life, that are just really seeking the truth and harmony, not to win. When I see my family, I see them each for who they really are and who they want to become. And when you can see that, you can stand for them. And even if you disagree, you can stand for them. You could be a champion for them. You can lift them up. And in return, it lifts me up. And then we all stand together as a family or a nation. 
We all have the strength to stand for others, standing with others, bearing their burdens, and being blessed by their joys. David wrote that song for me just a few years ago. I thought the summer of rage was going to happen in 2016. <laughs> Not so much. But he called me the other day and he said, Glenn, do you remember that song? And it's perfect. It's perfect. I think what we're doing here is we need to look to our children because I think they're going to be the ones to save the freedom. We may not see it, but I think he does. Because we keep looking for the next leader every four years and voting him into the office, and, and it's not going to happen that way. I think we need to look to the next Washington or Lincoln in our own homes. And I am beginning to believe that we are not the generation. And every moment that we spend on something other than teaching our children the ways of the Lord in true liberty, we're going to be held accountable for it. Nothing will ever be more important than the work we do right now inside the four walls of our home. But if we are worthy, if we are right and just, he is going to show us the way. He is doing things all around the world right now that none of us are aware of. 
People who have been prepared for this time, you're probably one of them. People that don't see how their peace fits, but you will. You just have to stand where you're supposed to stand, do what you're supposed to do. We know we have to do something, something or another, like, like this. I'm doing this special because I feel like that's what he wants me to do. This is insane. I don't know if anybody's even going to watch this. And even if it does, how is it going to affect the country? Please. It would be really easy for me to dismiss and say, Lord, it's not going to be big enough. I mean, I'm just about to outline three easy steps that I think we need to take. But I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know his plan. This whole thing may just be because one person, maybe you, needed to hear the message that you are important. Your voice, your talent, your time, your relationships, they're of great value. So many Americans have just been beaten down, you know? I think the whole world. Look what happened in, with Brexit. The whole world, we're, we're told we don't really make a difference. Shut up. Shut up. The people in Washington, the people in London or wherever, they, they know what's right. You don't make a difference. Your voice doesn't matter. And now we actually believe it. It's a lie. This is your permission to speak and to stand. You are a valued son or daughter of God and what you think and do is important. As long as you're doing what he tells you to do. No more, no less. Prepare, stand, and act. Prepare, stand, act. We're all in the dark. But, and I love this, if we're all standing where we're supposed to be, when the lights go on, when the sun rises again, and we all have, we brought what we were supposed to bring, we're going to see a masterpiece revealed. It's like God is holding a giant surprise party for evil. Surprise! God planned this party. We just need to show up and bring what we were told to bring. Have faith in Him. He's got us if we allow him. While I'm talking about having faith in things, let me, let me speak to the next generation. Please have faith in yourself. You are the hope of all those around the globe who still are yearning to be free. They are waiting for someone, and you were born at this time in this country for a reason. You're strong enough and my generation should be there to help all we can. You are the hero generation. The last group in the cycle like you, they were also talked down by their elders. They, they, everybody said, I don't know, they're not strong enough. You know, they don't know how to put an honest day's work into it right now. Well, those people were worried about the generation that freed the world and ended the evil of Nazism, fascism, communism, and against all odds, and way too late when we came in and fought World War II. But that generation fought and won. Same with yours. Your ways may not be my way, but if you listen to him and they're his way, we are fine. You know, we're told... Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not see it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make rivers in the desert. Believe it. And know you're a part of it. Grow a personal relationship with him and he will guide you. I know this to be true. You will witness great and powerful miracles in your day. And I just hope I am there and we are together to give him the proper thanks in the end. Many in your generation have been lost to Marxism, to consumerism. They've been lost online. So many people of your generation are committing suicide. I come from a family of suicide. I know what that is. There's a hole. And when everything the world tells you is good doesn't fill that hole, 
There's nothing left. We have failed you. We have failed to teach you truly the things that are important. And we have allowed others to teach evil. So, three-step plan. Here is the first of three. It is an easy path to help re heal and restore the unity and hope. So let me take you there and show you the path. So the first real concrete step that we have to take. Number one, to restore unity and hope, learn the truth. We have to educate ourselves and our children on the truth. Become an evangelist for the truth. You're going to find expanded videos of the stories that you heard here today at AmericanCovenant.com. The AmericanCovenant.com. There will be additional videos and a beginning of a list of books that I would invite you to study and share at GlennBeck.com. At that website, we also have the Martin Luther King Pledge of Nonviolence. When I was in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, a few years ago, we marched uh, in Birmingham, and I asked everybody to sign um, that pledge. People didn't understand why, and I think you might understand why now. And we have to begin to live in the ways of our grandparents and our great-grandparents. We have to begin to re repurpose and reduce and reuse, repair, recycle, most of all, rethink. We have to use our resources carefully. Uh, we have to invest in those things that actually help build and not tear down, not divide, but unite the country. We all need to put our money to real use as well. I think all of our money is going to be worthless at some point, <laughs> any time anytime, uh, coming. So we might as well put it to use uh, in real ways. May I suggest a healthy donation or even just a monthly auto donation of a Lincoln, a $5 bill to a charity or charities that you trust. And those charities are working towards the goals of education, commitment to a higher purpose, and action. So I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions. Mercury One, full disclosure, this is the charity I started. You don't have to do Mercury One, but listen, if you're interested in education, we are now currently educating 17 to 24 year olds. We've been doing it for the last three years, a leadership training program. It's two weeks in Dallas, Texas, where the students have hands-on education. We have access to more founding documents, the originals, than anyone other than the National Archives and the Library of Congress. And they learn what is true, our true history, by using those original documents. And we're about to unveil a new education center later this summer that we have been busy building where we will be expanding the courses to all ages and families, both in person and soon online. I would invite you to apply to attend some of those, or you could just donate to further the cause at mercuryone.org. Also, the Woodson Center. Boy, the people that are working there, they are more than worthy of your time and your investment at 1776unites.com. Bob and I are going to be talking about some things that we're going to be doing in some communities that I think you're going to be very interested in helping. Um, they are currently engaged in the black communities to speak the truth of 1776 and to dispel the verifiable lies and poison of the 1619 project. They believe in results and they take kids out of these gangs. They teach them the truth about their history, themselves, our God, and they thrive. If our country deserves saving, it will be saved at the local level, and it all begins with education. Educate yourself and others, step one. Step two, commit to that truth. I'm gonna ask you in a few minutes to listen to the words from the 1863 covenant that Abraham Lincoln declared. I want you to listen to it. I want you to discuss it me its meanings with your friends and your family after this broadcast. I want you to share it with members of your church or synagogue. Then take it to them and encourage them to take it and spread the word. You'll find at theamericancovenant.com a copy of the oath. It's free. You can print it, sign it with your family, and put it in a prominent place for your family to remember to honor that oath. 
After Abraham Lincoln had been driven to his knees and he begged the Lord, what do you want? He made a personal covenant with God, personal. After the Battle of Antietam, after it was won, Lincoln then told people and said, I made a covenant and I will, quote, honor that oath I gave to myself and my maker. This was personal before it was national. Same here, this must be personal, a personal commitment to live the way God asks us to. And the third step is action. We have to, we have to commit to making a difference in people's lives, a real difference. You know, I, I could handle some of these organizations that are currently marching against oppression if they were actually doing everything they could to stop oppression and slavery that is happening all over the world and in the United States. Yes, slavery. During the Western slave trade, it lasted 400 years. There were 11 million slaves through that 400 year period. Today, there are 40 million slaves around the world and we're no different than those who lived in colonial times. We pretend that it doesn't happen. We pretend it's not all around us and we remain silent and we don't really wanna know about it because it's so ugly. We cannot be those people. This is a cause that can unite all Americans. I don't know anybody who says, oh, you know, slavery's not so, no, it's bad, it's horrible. It was then, it's, it's, it's horrible now. That can unite us. A couple of years ago, I was in Mexico City and I was speaking to a woman that had actual chain marks all around her neck. She had scars from the years she had spent chained to a wall. Scars on her arms and on her legs and her body where they would burn her with a hot iron if she had to go to the bathroom too many times. She was rescued by a group of real heroes. Many of you helped with the additional and, the, and initial funding to start that organization that freed her, it's Operation Underground Railroad. Tim Ballard and I went down to meet with her after she had gone through the OUR treatment program and she was the brightest light. I did an interview with her, you can find it online. It's in Spanish and I asked her about being a slave and she told me, I was not a slave. Others called me a slave, but in my mind, I was not nor ever will be a slave. Only I can write my life story. Wow. I'm with her. And that's the weekend I come home to see the first bout of students tearing down statues because they said the statue was oppressing them. We got to get out of ourselves because we don't know what real oppression is. We got to get beyond ourselves and finish Lincoln's mission. Tonight, I implore Americans to renew the covenant and put it into action by becoming an abolitionist today. Save the slaves that are currently in slavery in the darkest of worlds, the worlds of sex slavery where children as young as two are bought and sold. The Nazarene Fund, which we started together in Birmingham, has, I am proud to say, become one of the most influential, if not the leading force to rescue and free those who are persecuted and enslaved now because of their faith. And they are all over this planet. I urge you to join one or both of these groups to free a slave now. I don't even know. It's tens of dollars, tens of dollars, maybe $20. How many people can you and your family, your church, your school, your place of business, how many people will unite around that cause, come together? How many slaves can you free by the end of the year? Begin to act in ways that will unite and actually do good. Become a modern abolitionist and act now. Yep, it's a steep path but it's really not that hard. Abraham Lincoln said it best at Gettysburg. It is up to us living to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought have thus so far nobly advanced. It's for us 
here to be dedicated to the great task that's right there. To take from the honored dead, take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That all of us here highly resolve that those dead shall not have died in vain. And if the American experiment snuffs out now, it will be. If we fail now, all those lost fighting in all the wars, in all of the skirmishes, in all of the people all around the world that were striving for freedom, all the ideas we were founded on, the, the ideas that people came here and risked their lives on a raft, on a cargo ship, in a death-defying journey just to live it and share with their children opportunity, all of that will be in vain. All of that will be lost, and the world will be told, man must have a master, because the American experiment failed. And only when the Western ideas and ideals are finally laid to rest in some lonely gravestone that no one visits, that's when the real evil and the devourers will come again, and the rest of the world will realize how good and noble and freeing the West and the Western culture truly was. We must stand now and be more empathetic and charitable than we've ever been. Otherwise, we put that theory to test. And George Washington knew to beat the greatest army and Navy ever assembled, his farmers and shopkeepers that just had pitchforks, they needed to have the blessings and miracles of God. And they are coming again if we are worthy. They needed to be on His side. That's different. God's not on our side. We have to be on His side. We need to be the people of virtue and merit again. Or we could cower. I mean, I feel like doing that sometimes. It's frightening, I know. But the path is right here. We just need to take the first steps. Taking the oath that Lincoln set forth in 1863 and then follow it with action. And if we do these things, if we do them honestly and consistently with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work that we're in and bind up the nation's wounds to care for him that bore the burden of this battle for the widow, for the orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Boy, I tell you, we take those three steps and we do it, we live it, this nation will have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Come, take this path with us. It is the duty of nations and of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow. Yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in holy scriptures, and proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And in so much as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power 
as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace. And multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom. In virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. All this being done in sincerity and truth. Let us then rest humbly in the hope, authorized by the divine teachings, that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high and answered with blessings, no less than the pardon of our national sins and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country to its former happy condition of unity and peace.
I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends, and we must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. That's how Abraham Lincoln ended his first inaugural, and then the Civil War started. The most eastern tip of America now is dark. The darkness tonight gently falls across this great storied and diverse land. Here in the Mountain West, the light is now slipping behind her purple mountains. Majesty. In an hour or so, the very edge of this land, on the other side, the house and street lights will begin to come on, and the ships in the harbor will begin to see the reflections of her alabaster cities gleam in the waves of the mighty ocean deep. If we are lucky enough to live somewhere where man's light does not block the light of the great universe we swim in, tonight we can go outside and look up and perhaps see just a part of our next chapter as a country, as men with wings now prepare to once again fly through space to discover and claim new frontiers and new homes. The darkness of nightfall is good. It is natural, it is normal. And when we really appreciate it, it makes us feel small and insignificant, and that's good. It comes every night to refresh and to bring rest. And tomorrow, the brightness will come again with the sun warming the earth and her peoples. And in the sunlight, we will remember once again who we truly are, humbled by the stars the night before. And we will be ready to do what Americans always do, our best. We are going to fail. In this journey, we are gonna fail. We'll fail ourselves, we'll fail one another. And God forbid, we will at times fail our God. But we know the promise of our God. We know the promise of this land. It's not about the number of times we fall or fail, but the number of times we get back up again and strive to do our very best. There is forgiveness. I'm so fortunate to be the steward of this land. I come out here sometimes and I, I think of the people that first explored and crossed some of these mountains, who with their children, perhaps a cow or an oxen, or some of them just with a simple hand cart full of the few belongings, they crossed this land with hope and with faith. I wonder how many died before the journey was through. But most of them, most of them arrived at their destination. Most of them saw, finally, the land that they had only dreamt about. But I want you to know, unlike them, the journey we set out on tomorrow, none of us are ever gonna see the destination. A place run by men that is always just and fair and equitable, it won't happen because man is flawed. But we are up to the challenge to strive to, quoting our founders, make a more perfect nation. We'll never be perfect. We just have to try to be a more perfect nation tomorrow than we are today. What makes this journey so exciting is that, as is everything in life, it's never about the destination. It is all about the journey and what a journey this promises to be. We were all born here at this time in this nation, each of us with a purpose to build up, to look up and to help up. There is glory in this land, just as there is glory in our God. As the battle hymn states, a God who died to make men holy. 
tomorrow. Let's come together. Let's begin to live to make men free. I will stand. I will raise my voice. I will hold your hand. For we are one. From the Standing Rock Ranch. In God's country. Good night, America.